Tonight is a celebration of the role of ideas in foreign policy and an opportunity to honor a giant of our age, a true scholar statesman, whose public life has been so animated by the value of scholarship in the service of the public good. So, we are continuing a tradition that we began last year with our memorable conversation with our inaugural honorees, George Schultz and Bernard Lewis. And let me just take a moment to note that uh, Professor Lewis was supposed to be here this evening, called just a couple of hours ago to send his regrets. He's, he has a cold and couldn't travel, but he dearly wanted me to pass on his regards to Dr. Kissinger and to all of us. So we're going to take advantage of this opportunity with our limited time, not to have a speech, but hopefully an instructive and enlightening conversation with Dr. Kissinger on a bit of the past, a bit of the present, and a bit of the future. And hopefully we can all end this evening a bit wiser than when we came here tonight. So, Dr. Kissinger, if I can begin. What did you tell Sarah Palin? <laughs> Because you betcha, she, get, she learned something. <laughs> well, uh, before I answer the question, <laughs> let me thank you for this evening. I am very moved, not just by the honor, but by what you have said, and especially what Charles Krauthammer has said. He is, to me, the preeminent analyst and columnist of this period. And I read him every week with extraordinary attention. And it meant a great deal to me that he noted qualities for which I would like to be noted and not very <laughs> And uh, for somebody who came here as a refugee, having experienced the fate of the Jewish people and then to be permitted to participate in, in efforts to expand the cause of freedom and in the life and death struggle of the Jewish people was a blessing that fate has bestowed on me. And I'm very grateful to all of you for giving me this opportunity to be here. Thank you. Now, um, Sarah Palin. When, when uh, I, in my basic view is that when you talk to high officials or aspirants to high office, the wisest course is to tell them exactly what you believe and to answer their questions. And Sarah Palin was projected in a very brief period into enormous prominence. Uh, and she's attempting to fulfill that role with dignity and intelligence. And she should be respected for what fate has brought to her that she didn't particularly seek 
and I dealt with her and will continue to deal with her insofar as she asks me in that framework. Let me ask a question which I'm sure if most people could ask you, this is at least high on their list. Given the vagaries of the world today, what is, in your view, the greatest security challenge facing America in 2008? The greatest short-term security challenge. I mean, I could, one could go on and talk about the evolution of the balance of power and the shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific and similar issues, but the shortest short-term challenge is uh, the role of Iran and the role of uh, nuclear proliferation and the impact of this on jihadist terrorism. You've just opened up my next five questions. As Charles noted, um, uh, your views on Iran are central to our presidential debate. So let me ask you if you can take a moment to expand on your view of how the United States can most appropriately and effectively prevent Iran from acquiring a military nuclear capability. Well, uh, I begin, of course, with the proposition that the spread of nuclear weapons, if it is not contained, is going to bring about a, uh, a catastrophe for mankind. Even in the Cold War, for me, the most difficult problem was when I asked myself, what do I tell the president when he informs me that he has exhausted all recourse and he now has to uh, use nuclear weapons. What would be my recommendation? Because the consequences of nuclear war would be uh, horrendous and beyond the historic moral capacities of, uh, of human experience. On the other hand, to acquiesce in uh, the, uh, at that time, uh, uh, ideology, the communist ideology would be to open the world to potential genocide by refusing to recognize one's danger. But we didn't have to face the, that question, no matter what one reads today. We never came close to actually using nuclear weapons. But at that time, nuclear weapons were held by countries that had more or less comparable analyses of risks. Uh, nuclear weapons are now spreading into the hands of countries in which suicide bombing is considered a strategy and in which the judgment of the value of human life has a different dimension and it's geared towards what happens in the next life and not in, uh, in, in this life. Also, it moves towards societies that cannot safeguard nuclear weapons uh, as the more advanced countries could. Uh, so for all of these reasons, to stop the spread of nuclear weapons now is an absolute imperative. Uh, we, have, we have, in order to do this, we have to get clear about a number of uh, of issues. One, how much time is there for diplomacy? In other words, when will a point be reached when the Iranian capacity to, uh, to reprocess material has reached a level at which it is, will be almost impossible to stop it, or where they will have accumulated so much material that uh, they will possess enough for a a uh, destructive attack on, on uh, enough of their neighbors. Uh, second, what is the impact of their being able to do this 
in the face of a unanimous vote of the Security Council backed by Germany and Japan that they should not continue reprocessing. Uh, what is the impact on the international system if, this, if, uh, if, this, if a unanimous vote of the Security Council repeatedly taken is, uh, uh, is ignored? And finally, how do we get matters to a point at which we can uh, convincingly tell our public that we have taken every step to avoid uh, taking stronger measures? So for all of these reasons, uh, I have favored a willingness to negotiate the issue. Because I think that the present courts where the three European countries, in effect backed by the United States, are conducting negotiations with marginal proposals followed by marginal sanctions, really plays into the hands of the uh, people who, who are proliferating. Uh, so we have to get clear how much time we have. Secondly, what we can, what we should propose as, as an outcome. How much time we can give that process which is related to the first point. And finally, what we are going to do if it turns out that the negotiations uh, uh, do not succeed. Uh, those are questions that will have to be dealt with, in my view, within the first 18 months of a new administration. And in my view, there is no getting around them. So the time frame is 18 months for resolution or decision? Yes. yes. And negotiation. And negotiation. I don't think one can, one, one can hide behind negotiation. I think negotiation has to be part of the process.